Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are taking a break this morning from the Gospel of Mark, as we did last week, last week for Christmas Eve, and I thought it would be appropriate, since this is New Year's Eve, for us to uh, have a particular <laughs> message directed toward that. And so I've chosen 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, and... Uh, I'm going to read that in a moment, but next week we will return to the Gospel of Mark and resume our studies in that. But this is a text I think that uh, should focus our minds on what we should be thinking about today. It's not that the Scriptures lay forth a, a uh, schedule for us that we, we preach Christmas sermons on a certain day of the year, and then New Year's Eve sermons, that kind of thing. But uh, this should, I think, <clears throat> help focus our minds on the things that are important and how we should be looking at, at the coming year. So, a New Year's Eve sermon for this morning, beginning with verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. In the 13th century B.C., Pharaoh Ramses II dedicated a temple he built. It was to be, he said, a palace to the Lord of the gods forever. The person who wrote the article that I read stated, The Egyptians built for eternity. But eternity is a long time, and as impressive as their monuments are, the pyramids, the sphinx, the pillars and statues that remain, they're in ruins, and they won't last forever. Only the Christian is a builder for eternity. Now that's how Paul describes us in so many words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He calls himself a master builder. He has laid the foundation of a great house, which he later calls a temple of God. It's the church. There is no more important building in the world than that building. Not to God. And Paul says we're all part of the same work. We, we too are builders, raising up God's temple on earth. Imagine one of the great cathedrals of Europe with scaffolding and workers on it, busily doing different things, some cutting stones, others setting those stones in place as its massive spires reach to the sky. We're doing that on God's house. Only His house, His temple, is not material. It is spiritual. We're building the church it may seem like a, a paradox that we are the church and at the same time builders of the church, but so we are. Later in chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul gives instruction on spiritual gifts. Every Christian has a gift. We have all been equipped to do our task. We are also priests within God's temple. Each one of us is that. And after this 
ministry of the word service, we will engage in that priestly service of taking the Lord's Supper and uh, praying and worshiping the Lord. But it's a great work that we have been given to do, and it's a great privilege. So, how are you building? Now, that's a good question to ask ourselves every day of the year, but especially today, this last day of the year 2017. And as we're looking forward to the new year, the year to come, ask ourselves the question, how are we building? Paul tells us it is important that we be careful how we build because the work is so important and because someday our work will be tested by fire. The result of the test will be either great reward or great loss. So how are you building? That will be determined by how we are building our own lives personally. That's not necessarily the theme of this passage I'm looking at. It is that of building the church. But I would say that we cannot build the church well unless we are building our lives personally. We will not live for the common good of the church, which is the standard that Paul sets later in this book, if we're not building our own lives well. The things we do individually have great consequences. And those consequences go back to the personal choices that we make. Paul's purpose here is both to urge and direct us to make right choices. And he gives the standard, or if we want to follow the theme of building here, the blueprint to follow both for our personal good and for the common good of the church. When he speaks in verse 10 of the foundation he laid as a master builder. Every well-built house is raised on a sound foundation. My wife and I used to spend time each year in Maine. The old houses there are all built on blocks of granite. So they stand for generations. And the foundation that Paul laid for the church there in Corinth was like granite, the rock of ages. He defined it in verse 11 as Jesus Christ. It is the person of Christ, certainly. And I'll say more about that in a moment as we come toward the end of our lesson about the personal aspect of Christ in our lives and in this whole theme of building the church and building our lives personally. We have a living Savior. So this foundation is certainly the person of Christ, but also, and I think mainly here, it is the doctrine of Christ. After all, we cannot know the person of Christ unless we know the truth about Christ, and that's doctrine. And the doctrine is specifically Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What Paul wrote about earlier in the book in chapter 2 and verse 2 when he said that he determined to know only that when he came to Corinth. Not philosophy, not the moral issues of the day, but this, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That, in fact, is the only foundation of the church. Paul laid it in Corinth. He laid it everywhere that he preached. In every city in Asia and Europe where he went and preached the gospel. And he says, others were building on it. So, he tells them, these builders, to build well. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. There's no other foundation but the gospel of the cross. There's no other foundation of the church but the crucified and risen Christ. So careful building is, first of all, building on the one foundation. Laying any other foundation is the basis of a different work and a different building, not the church. Men do that. They build structures and organizations on a foundation of a purely human Jesus or 
on works and ethics or social or political gospels. But it's not the church that is going up. There is only one foundation. And like the foundation of any building, it determines the, the size and the shape of the structure. Building can't be constructed off of the foundation. So the first step in building carefully is building on the foundation. It is being consistent with the gospel of the cross. But even when people build on the right foundation, they can build poorly. They can do sloppy work and they can use inferior materials. Paul lists some material in verse 12. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. I grew up on the King James Version, so that straw was stubble. That even gives a greater sense of the ephemeralness of it. Now, I doubt that, that Paul had any special meaning for each one of these. He, he is simply giving two kinds of building materials. One valuable, one worthless one that can stand up under God's test and one that cannot. Gold, silver, and precious stones seem like odd things to use in building, but they are durable. Gold and silver may, may melt, but they, they stand up, they survive. And that's, that's the main point that Paul is making here. But also... You study the temple that Solomon built, and you see he incorporated these kinds of materials in his building. It was expensively built. Solomon used the very best in constructing God's temple. So we too should give the best, the, the most valuable we have to this work. The point is the quality of the work, not the quantity of the work. Never quantity, never size. It's always about the character that matters. You can build bigger and more easily with wood and straw than you can with gold and silver. And it may be a structure that is impressive in its size and expanse, but it's also dangerously flammable. In 1923, Japan experienced what is called the Great Kanto Earthquake. And Kanto is Tokyo and the surrounding area. It happened at noon when the people were preparing uh, midday meals on their hibachis, their uh, charcoal braziers. The, the quake shook everything. Shook the houses, shook the kitchens, shook those hibachis, spilling live coals which caused a firestorm that swept through the densely built neighborhoods of wood and paper houses. They went up in an instant. The loss of life and property in Tokyo was catastrophic. In fact, they referred to it as an apocalypse. Now Paul says that there is plenty of stuff like that that passes as Christian work. It may be impressive to the eye, but it, it is worthless. And, and it's combustible, and someday it will burn up spiritually. Someday God is going to test the quality of our work as Christians. That's what Paul says in verse 13. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Now that happens over time. Things play out and the real nature of a work or a person becomes evident with time. It's called the test of time. And we'll say, well, let's just give it some time. and We'll see how things work. And that's certainly true, but, but Paul has something else in mind here. It is a day of testing. It's a special day. It's a final day of reckoning when Christ will evaluate our Christian service by putting it to the test. There was an article about a week and a half ago in the Wall Street Journal titled, Will Reckoning 
make it as the word of the year. And evidently, every year there's a word of the year. And this year, with uh, all the scandals that have taken place, the writer was wondering, will not the word reckoning be very important? Maybe that's the important word this year. Well, it's an important word in all of the word of God. And uh, we see it here, we see it elsewhere. For example, uh, Paul speaks of it in of this day of reckoning in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, where he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds, whether good or bad. He speaks of it in, in, this, in this book, in 1 Corinthians. In fact, in the next page over in, in chapter 4 and verse 5, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come from God. When the Lord returns to establish His kingdom on the earth, we will go through a period of examination. It will be a trial by fire. Now, it will be a joyful day, a day of fulfillment that brings the kingdom of God on earth, the, the Lord's reign when, as Isaiah put it in Isaiah 11, the wolf and the lamb will dwell together and a child will play beside the hole of an adder or a cobra. What we can only faintly imagine now an age of peace and safety, an age of health and prosperity will, will come in its fullness when all of the knowledge of God will fill the earth and, and it will be an age of light and glory. As I say, we can't even begin to comprehend what that is going to be like, the material changes that take place, the spiritual changes that occur. But according to the Word of God, it will begin as a time of examination. And the picture Paul gives is of a, a fire sweeping through a building and everything that's temporary, like wood and paper, will burn up. But the good things, the quality things, the things of true workmanship will survive. The results of the test are given in verses 14 and 15. If any man's work which he has built on it, meaning on the foundation, on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. <clears throat> a lot of theology has been poured into these verses and a lot of it is not good. Some have interpreted them of perdition and others have interpreted them of purgatory. It's not about either. These people are described as saved and that word is always used with a, a positive meaning. And in, in this context, it's about judging the surface, uh, judging the, the service of the saved or believers, not, not about purging or punishing their souls. The works of all believers will be tested. Those which are worthless will be burned up, but not the person. Unlike his works, he will be saved, though barely. That's, that's the idea in that expression, yet as through fire. It's like our expression, by the skin of his teeth. The picture that is given here is of a man running from a burning house. He's saved, but with nothing to show for his life. It's all gone. Now, that's, that's not a small thing, uh, of course. He, he or she is saved. There's no greater blessing than that. That is an eternal blessing beyond, again, our comprehension. Such a person will have eternal life, but less rewards and, as Charles Hodge put it, a lower place in the kingdom of heaven than he would have had. The things we do have consequences. 
This has particular reference to Christian service and especially to those who occupy positions of authority, elders, deacons, and teachers. God will judge our work. So, how are we building? What are we building? Is it a, a structure, a, a ministry that is in line with the foundation? Does it exalt Christ? Does our, our life and our service to others uh, promote Him and His glory and grace? There's a, there was a lot of activity in the church of Corinth. And you read that book and you see all of the activity that was going on. And you read it from the beginning through to the end. Lots of teaching and the use of spiritual gifts. But a lot of it was misused. There were people exalting one teacher over another, causing factions in the church. Others were uh, abusing the gift of tongues for reasons of pride. So there was, a lot, there was lots of activity in that church, but not to exalt Christ or, or for, as Paul sets the standard for true ministry later, for the common good, for the edification of the body. So... Some who have done a lot will in the end have nothing to show for it. Frederick Godet, who was a commentator, a Swiss commentator about uh, 100 years ago or so, suggested that this is the teacher who avoided hard doctrines and the whole counsel of God or avoided exposing error and took a pleasant root in his ministry in order to please people and do that in order to build a following for himself. And that may be the case. Maybe uh, he will have, have done that and maybe he will have gained a large crowd and large following. But in the end, it, it is for nothing when his work is put through the trial by fire and nothing is left of what he's done in his life but ashes. And some of the commentators interpret all of this of, of ministers in the church. And certainly, as I've already indicated, it, it has a lot to do with them. Uh, to whom much is given, much will be required. And so certainly they would be at the heart of, of all of this. But it, it can't be, in, in my opinion at least, it can't be limited to teachers and elders. 1 Corinthians doesn't allow for such a narrow vision of the passage. This is a book... And you see this later in particular with the gifts that are explained in chapters 12 and 13 and 14. This is a book that emphasizes what could be called an every man ministry of the church. We are all gifted. Every one of us has a spiritual gift. And, and all of us, therefore, have our responsibilities within the body of Christ. We all have our responsibility as we're on that great cathedral that's going up to, to be active and, and faithful to the ministry that God has entrusted us with. And the Lord, Paul is saying here, will someday judge every believer's work. So again, the question is, what are we doing and, and why do we do what we do? What's our motive? That is what Christ will examine. Were we faithful to him and to his word? So Paul was saying, ministers beware, build well. But again, not just ministers or teachers, but all Christians. You are builders in the church. You are builders of the church. Be careful how you build God's house. Now that's a sobering passage. This is, for all of us, someday we will be examined. Our works will be tested. And, and we might just see it all go up in flames. What a tragedy. If you've ever witnessed a house burn down, uh, you know what a tragedy it is and, and the sorrow that, that people feel knowing that irreplaceable things are gone forever. We've all, whether we've stood 
at a burning house and watch that take place or not. We've all, I think, probably seen recently the wildfires fires in California. And you've, if you've watched on the news, you've seen people interviewed and some of these people return to their homes and, and sift through the remains and find, to, to find something uh, of value, whether monetary value or just personal value of their memories. And all they have is ashes. I've seen that on the news and it's tragic. Nothing's left. But this is far more tragic. What Paul is doing here is not, I think, seeking to, to, to shame the church into good behavior, or I don't think he's trying to scare us into action. Now, that may be the consequence of it, but what I think Paul is doing here is giving us a heads up. He's telling us the truth of the Lord's parable about the master who returned from a long journey and wanted to see the results of his servants' investments. He'd given them talents and wanted to know what they did with them and how they did. And those who invested well pleased him and, and were rewarded for what they did and rewarded generously. It's Matthew chapter 25. Now, I don't know how this will happen, whether it will be a, a public event or a private one between us individually and the Lord. I tend to think it's, uh, it will be a private examination. I hope so. <laughs> Maybe it's wishful thinking. But uh, either way, the, the pain some will experience is, will not be public humiliation. But the acute sorrow of looking into the Lord's eyes, looking into the eyes of the Savior who laid down his life for me, who gave everything for me, and I have nothing to give him. What an opportunity we have today, right now, to serve the Savior. You know... In a moment, we'll take the Lord's Supper. That pleases Him. That pleases Him greatly. It's some of the, one of the great commands he gave, he gave to us. Do this in remembrance of me. And when we do that, that is pleasing to the Lord. And that's a sweet aroma to Him. This is one of the opportunities He's given to serve Him and please Him. We don't have a lot of time to do that in this world. Life is short. It goes by in the blink of an eye, as John Calvin said. It certainly does. We don't have a lot of time, but we do have enough time to do work that pleases Him, to live a life that pleases Him. It's the time that He has assigned to each and every one of us, and it's enough. Those that use it will hear the words from Him well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. What great words those are. What great words they will be to hear. Paul says, if any man's work remains, he will receive a reward. The Lord will never be anyone's debtor. You will never do anything for the Lord that He will not abundantly reward you for it. He more than repays the smallest act of service in His name, whether it's a cup of water, a cup of cold water to a thirsty person. That is great service in the eyes of the Lord, and He rewards that. What we do as Christians in this life counts for all eternity. And that, that includes everything we do, every moment of our life. Now, some have difficulty with the idea of rewards. It seems to conflict with uh, grace and suggests that, uh, that God's blessings on us are conditional and that we earn His favor. But it's clear from this 
that Paul did teach that there are rewards for faithful service. And the Lord taught that, taught that in Matthew chapter 25. He taught it in Matthew chapter 6. He said, for your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I think maybe there's a lot to be said for that word in secret. We think of service as something we do outwardly. It's like this. It's preaching sermons. It's standing before people. It's doing things in, in the before people publicly, but what the Lord values is what you do in your heart. He sees these things. He values things that others may not see, but He sees it. And He'll bring it to light, as Paul speaks of in the next chapter. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there you have another example of the Word of God teaching this truth about rewards for service. But that in no wise jeopardizes grace. Grace is the, the very ground or reason that a person serves God with energy and purity. Our success in the Christian life is altogether due to the grace of God. And Paul indicated that at the beginning of this passage in verse 10. He, he begins by stating that he was a wise master builder. That's what Paul is, a wise man, a master builder according to the grace of God. God's grace is the source of all blessing. It was the, the source of Paul's apostleship. This is what amazed the Apostle Paul that this Pharisee of the Pharisees, this Hebrew of the Hebrews could be made the apostle to the Gentiles. That's the grace of God. Grace is the reason that he had his ministry to the Gentiles, it was the reason that he had his ability to go to them and preach, and preach to the Jews, preach to everyone. Later in chapter 15 and verse 10, he says that. He, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then he speaks of his labors and how they were not in vain. Why were they not in vain? Because of enabling grace. Ultimately, of course, God, God rewards us for what He has done in us, not for what we have done to earn His favor. His favor, His life and power cause us to work. And that, that is not a motivation for laziness, just the opposite. He speaks all of that in order to, one, explain Himself, and say, in effect, I can't take credit for things. Yes, I work. I work harder than all of the other gospel, uh, all of the other apostles, he says. But it's not me. It's the grace in me. And so he's, he's giving credit where credit's due. He's honoring God, not himself. But he also gives this as a real motivation to all of us. That we, we should serve diligently and we can because of the grace that's at work in us. Now that gives incentive. God helps us. God helps us every day, every moment. We are not alone in this great work into which He's called us. But it also shows the fact that God's grace is in all of it. It also shows how important the church is to the Lord. And there's a day of reckoning. And He holds people to account for how we build. There is great reward for faithful service but great loss for careless work. That's motivation for service. The fear of loss, the hope of gain, that's motivation. That's not the highest motivation. The greatest motive for serving and sacrificing for Christ is love for Him. That is what will drive a person to serve gladly. That's what moved the Apostle Paul to cross mountains and rivers and oceans to give the gospel, to suffer all kinds of hardship. In the next book, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he wrote, The love of Christ controls us, or the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ is not Paul's love for Christ, but Christ's love for Paul. When he thought of that, when he thought of the Son of God loving him 
a self-righteous Pharisee, a rebel, a man who thought he was doing God's work at the same time was killing Christians, when he looked at that and, and he thought that Christ loved him and snatched him as a fire from the burning and made him the apostle to the Gentiles, as he thought about that, it, it filled him with such gratitude that it motivated him to do the things that he did, moved him to act and, and, and serve and sacrifice. And this brings me back to a point I made earlier. While this passage is about building God's temple, and many of the commentators make that point, that this is about service and building the church, and I, I don't disagree with that, I think it is, but while it is about that, in order to do that well, we must be building our own souls personally, developing an affection for Christ. How do we do that? Well, we do that to get the love that Christ had for the Lord and that we should have. We do that by getting to know Him. The way to expel bad things or, or good things that are not the best things in our life is to do so with something that's much better. And how do you develop an interest in anyone or anything? You spend time. In order to have, gain an affection for, for someone, you, you learn about him or her. You spend time with that person and you, you learn of their virtue as you do that. And as you do that you naturally grow in your admiration for that individual. And it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. As we spend time with Him and His Word, we learn about Him. We learn about His virtues. We learn about His attitudes. We learn of His love for us. Undeserved as it is, we learn of His great sacrifice for us. Who we were that He saved and what He did for us to save us. And as we learn that, our love for Him increases. But Christ is not only a fascinating figure of history that we should study, not only the, the focal point of the Word of God, and if you read it clearly, you read, the, you read of the Son of God from the beginning to the end of it. He's not only that, someone we study, he is, he is alive. We have a relationship with Him. Christ crucified and resurrected, re resurrected is the foundation of the church, and, 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 and we have a living relationship with Him. He speaks to us through the Bible and the Holy Spirit. We talk to Him in prayer. The Bible speaks of, of the great saints walking with the Lord. And we can do that. Each one of us can do that. We can walk with the Lord God every day. And He promises never to leave us. That's quite a, a thought when you think about it. God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, says, I want to be with you and I'm never going to leave you. If you're His child, that's what He says. We will... Never serve the Lord well. We will never be careful builders of His church if we do not first build our lives around a personal relationship with the Lord God. That is wisdom. Proverbs 9 begins, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. The house with seven pillars is a stable house. It's a spacious house. That house is a wise life. That's where we need to live each day. There's no wiser life and no more stable and rewarding life than a life lived for Christ. Serving the Lord, being a builder of His house. I think that's the application for us from this passage today. We're at the end of one year and the beginning of the next. Who knows 
what this coming year may bring. If you want to enter it wisely, then live in wisdom's house. Be a builder for eternity. I won't say make that your New Year's resolution. We're famous, all of us, for making resolutions and not keeping them. But I do urge all of us to make that our prayer today and every day. May God help all of us to be careful builders, wise master builders. He's given us the ability to do our job, our work, a work of service and worship for Him. If you're here without Christ, we're glad you're here. But you are building for eternity as well. But it's an eternity of darkness and fire. Not this fire, a different fire that's unquenchable. Hell is real, but there is a way of escape. It's through Jesus Christ, God's Son. He became a man in order to die for sinners and save the lost. And he invites you to come to him. I love that picture that he gives us in Isaiah chapter 65. He said, I spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. He's spreading out his hands for you if you're not a believer. You're one of those rebellious people. Don't refuse his invitation. Come to Christ, believe in him. And then live for Him in the greatest work that anyone can do. Build for eternity. i got to help you to do that. Help all of us to do that as we face this new year. May it be a glorious year of service for Him. I'm going to close now in a word of prayer. And then before we take the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing in the hymns of praise book number 41, Behold the Lamb. So let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the instruction that the Apostle Paul gave us. And it is wisdom. May we consider it well. And may we all be men and women who serve you well. Not out of a feeling that we must do this. It's our duty to do this but to do so out of gratitude for what you've done for us. May the love of Christ, the love, His love for us, constrain us, compel us to serve you. May that be our desire as we face a new year. May it be a year of service and worship to Him. We give you thanks for the salvation we have. We thank you now for this opportunity we have to celebrate the Lord's Supper and take the elements of wine and bread and pray that as we do so, it will remind us of who He is and what He's done for us. Thank you for Him. pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.